Hello everyone and welcome to this recording where uh, by now you must have received your uh, grades. And of course, what I promise you of course, is in, in case you're wondering about what I was expecting from you from the answers. And I just thought I would, the way I would go about doing that is actually uh, showing you all the questions and ex exactly what it is that I was expecting from you from the answers. And essentially uh, I have been, in my opinion, very, very lenient in terms of how I've graded your uh, assignments. Essentially the way I, I looked at was again, how comprehensive was your explanation. And I was really surprised that despite me saying that answer in detail, most of you did not necessarily take the opportunity to explain it in detail. You had a whole day uh, to actually answer your questions and essentially the barring four or five uh, individuals who actually took the time to explain each of the answers in detail. And those were the ones who were able to score a higher uh, point. And for others, essentially, most of you sort of had an idea about what you had to say. But I still felt that uh, some of you well, pretty much winged it. So essentially, I saw some answers where I go like, this is, ex this is exactly what uh, well, I mean, is this exactly what I was saying in my recorded sessions as well? Uh, so again, what I'm going to do is that I'm going to share my screen and I'm going to tell you exactly what I was looking for in the uh, questions and what your responses to that would be. So essentially uh, what you have was, of course, we were talking about the whole idea of the exam one. So the first thing, uh, the first question is about uh, briefly explain the Salesforce effectiveness framework. Here, what I was expecting you to of course talk about was again, for those who got a much higher score is you begin by talking on the right hand side where we talk about again, the performance of your organization and how that re relies on three aspects, which is actually the performance of your customers and then what's happening in the external environment and what is happening in the internal environment. I am not gonna go over it again, but if you go back to your notes and if you go back to what we've discussed, I've explained this time and again. And then specifically, we talked about the five drivers of Salesforce effectiveness. Now, again, my expectation was for you to explain each driver. So most of you, all you did was you just took what was exactly there in the slide and just put it in without giving an explanation. So I still gave you some points, but that is not the answer. I was expecting you to go in detail, not too much in detail, but at least three or four lines in your own words. So the ones who did get it right, so essentially the definer driver is all about defining what your sales organization should be. And in order for you to do that, you need to understand what kind of segments do we need to go after? What is going to be our offering? How is that structured to your sales process? And what kind of sales organization do you need? Now, this is then going to be followed by the shaper driver, where the purpose of a shaper driver is to make sure that your, your salespeople are chosen the right way, they are trained the right way, and of course, they are provided the right kind of sales coaching for them to be successful and the incentives as well. So I ex expected you to talk about how shaping the behavior of your salespeople is very important because we talk about the activities that salespeople are expected to be doing. And that is how you shape the behavior of your salespeople to get the kind of activity that you want. Then there were exciters. The exciters were how would I keep my people motivated? And here you had a combination of coaching, you had a combination of uh, leadership, you had a combination of incentives, and all of this were done. And the main purpose is to make sure that we keep our salespeople motivated to be on the job and get the job done. Explaining this in your words is what I was looking for, not just taking bullet points of what you saw on the slides. That is not what it is. That is where I expected you to explain each one of these. Then, of course, you have the enlighteners, and enlighteners, again, are uh, those uh, that those drivers where it has got to do with how do I help my salespeople provide the right kind of knowledge for them uh, to get, uh, to make sure that how you provide them the right kind of knowledge for them to be able to be successful on the job and doing the kind of things that you want them to be doing. And then of course, once you have this, then uh, the last thing is control. It says, how do I do performance management? How do I, make sure that for all the efforts that we have put into to help the salespeople, recruit the salespeople, make sure that we provide them with the right kind of tools, with the right kind of skill set, 
are they performing the way they're supposed to be? Again, this is what I was expecting. And a couple of you, I mean, around three to four people actually pretty, did a pretty good job of actually answering all this. But for the others, even if you just mentioned uh, th these things and just did a cut and paste, I gave you some points, but not the whole points that you might actually get for this particular question. The next thing is what is segmentation? So again, the segmentation is the process by which you take the whole universe of your potential customers and then divide them into groups so that within each group, the customers are similar. Uh, and of course, across each group, the customers are dissimilar. Now, the question is, how do I try to uh, go about uh, dealing with this? Is how do I go about trying to identify the right kind of segmentation criteria? So in this class, I talked about B2C and B2B, but specifically, I wanted you to focus on B2B. So essentially, uh, I was looking at the profile of the customer. So essentially, we're talking about firmographics. Uh, so that is something that I was expecting for. And then if, it, if you just don't say firmographics, you need to explain this. I did explain this in class. You have firmographics, then you have the behaviors of your customers. And then of course you have the needs of the customers. And again, in terms of the needs of the customers, I was hoping that some of you would mention that yes, there are customer needs, but we also need to understand that within the customers, you have the decision-making unit. Now, if you did not talk about the decision-making unit, but at least if you try to explain each one of these, you would have gotten more points. Now, uh, in terms of once you answer this, then I expected you to answer segmentation at Hillrom. I did not want you to use Hillrom to answer the question on segmentation. That is why I had it as separate parts of the question. So Hillrom again was the idea of how they said the traditional way of segmenting was not working and how they decided to segment it based on the different people that they would see within the customer's organization and then have a specific expertise from within Hill Romp to actually meet the requirements of uh, experts as well as generalists. Then on top of it, how they took a look at really important customers and key customers. So that is what we're looking for. So again, once you do define segmentation and targeting that is done at the marketing level, what Hildrom did was actually done at the customer level, which is what we call customer portfolio analysis. And I talked about this in the class, but almost none of you picked it up. But if you had mentioned all of this, if you specifically looked at segmentation, talked about segmentation in terms of B2B criteria that you would use, then you talk about targeting, then uh, once you do that, and then you talk about Hillrom, chances are that you would have gotten more higher points on this one. Uh, what is a value proposition? That's the next one. Um, what are the value proposition here? I specifically wanted you to take a look at the articles. Some of you, I have no idea where you got the answer from. Maybe you just went to the web and looked it up, but that was not what I was looking for. There's a specific hint, which I said, go take a look at your weekly reading, where it was a value propositions reading, as well as where I explained this in class. So what is a value proposition? A value proposition is a set of statements that tells a customer why they should choose to buy from you rather than the competition. The idea being you should be talking about benefits to the customer. Right. Now, in order for you to have the benefits of the customer, uh, you need to make sure that I understand what are the needs of the customers, uh, and which means that if in terms of the sales organization, because they are in contact with the customers, they have to have an idea about how to get the customers to say what their needs are. On top of it, as a sales organization in a business to business situation, you will be dealing with multiple members of the business unit, business unit um, and then uh, on top of that, um, uh, each member of the decision-making unit is going to have their own set of needs. And based on their set of needs, uh, you will have to then link it to the benefits that each individual is going to get within their organization. And that is something that you need to build up on. Now, another key part of a good value proposition is I should know about what's happening with my competition. Again, as a salesperson, because I'm talking to the customers, I am more likely to know ex exactly what my competition can offer and where I can be different. So that is again, something that you need to be uh, taking a look at. So that is what I was expecting you from the answer. And what are the three types of value propositions? The three types of value propositions are, the first one is all benefits and all benefits is where you only identify your benefits, but you do not necessarily identify whether the customer values those benefits, or you have no idea what the competition is doing. 
Then the second kind of value proposition is a favored points of difference, favorable points of difference. Here is where you try and take a look at how you are better than the competition, but you don't necessarily verify whether the points where you're different from the competition is important to the customer, yes or no. And then of course, the last one is where you have the, uh, the resonating focus. That's the golden standard where of course, you need to make sure that not only do I understand what the needs of the customers are so that I can tailor my benefits according to the needs of the customers, but I can also say how my benefits are different from the competition. And that is going to give you the advantage that you need for this, right? And this is what I was expecting for this answer, right? The next one, what is the go-to market strategy for a firm? And here, um, specifically, I even gave you hints about link it to the four different types of sales processes. So the go-to market strategy uh, is essentially how an organization decides how it's gonna bring its products and services to its end customers. And it consists of two aspects, which is channel design and channel management, right? So now channel design has got to do with deciding how many layers are there between you and the end customer. It talks about how I need to make sure that am I going to go direct with my own salespeople or am I going to go indirect with my channel partners? Or am I going to go with hybrid where it's going to be a combination of to some customers I go direct, to other customers I go indirect, and then you might also go with e-commerce. That is channel design, what and how you go to that particular market. Once I decide to work with those channel partners, then how do I go about managing them? How do I make sure that they have the right contracts? How do I make sure that they are behaving the way they're supposed to be doing? And that is channel management. And here, quite some of you got it all mixed up, right? And again, for exam number two, I strongly urge you to pay attention to the videos. And that is extremely critical because a feeling I got was that some of you were not paying attention to the videos. And so you got what are obviously easy questions wrong as well. Now, how is it linked to the four different kinds of sales processes? Essentially, we talked about transactional sale where you are mostly uh, dealing with a buyer who is not looking at you as a valued customer. Then you have the functional where the customer keeps buying back from you again and again, but does again not look at you as a strategic supplier. Consultative selling is where it starts getting interesting where you are able to go and help the customer solve more complex problems rather than just being seen as somebody I wanna go buy something with. And then the last one, of course, is your enterprise customers, that's key accounts. And that is something that we are going to watch today. I said, we're gonna actually discuss a little bit more today when we talk about how to deal with key accounts, yeah? So um, that is what we will be looking at. Uh, and essentially where go-to-market strategy is that when you look at transactional and functional customers, transactional and functional customers are where you want to reduce your costs. So your go-to-market strategy might be to go indirect, that is going with channel partners. Channel partners could be dealers, distributors, uh, retailers, and those kind of things. And of course, to the more consultative customers and as well as the more top-end customers, you go direct with your own salespeople. Right? And that is essentially what I was expecting for. And that leads me to the last one. And here is pretty much where it was pretty obvious that many of you who were not there for the live session did not necessarily go through the whole video. And again, that defeats the purpose of why uh, I have these speakers coming in. And uh, in fact, between now and the next session, if you're gonna have more guest speakers, I will make sure that I'll be asking a lot more questions from what the guest speakers are saying. So do pay attention to what they have to say. The go-to market strategy with an MCC label is you begin by, first of all, most of you got it right, looking at the eight different segments that they go after. But it's the go-to market has not got to do the eight segments, has got to do with within these segments, what does a typical sales process look like? And essentially what they said was they mostly went direct. They went direct because what they wanted to do was not the small orders, they wanted the really big orders. So mostly they worked with consultative clients as well as key accounts. And so what they said was that their go-to market strategy was going direct, uh, where even though they had e-commerce solutions, they were thinking of coming out of the e-commerce solutions, but they wanted to go direct to their customers 
with their existing salespeople. And then of course you had them talk a lot more about how they deal with the Coca-Colas of the world, the Procter and Gambles of the world in terms of key accounts. So that is essentially what I was trying to go for where I wanted to specifically say they were looking at eight different segments. They had a, a complex value proposition. They had a very good reputation in the market. They had a good offering. But of course, when it comes to that, they did not want to go for the transactional or the functional customers. They wanted to only go for the high end customers. So they went direct with either key accounts or the other accounts. So again, I feel that most of you did an okay job. But again, having said that, the overall uh, feeling I had was that some of you did not necessarily pay attention to the recordings. Uh, so again, uh, pay attention to the recordings next time. And here is a hint as well. The next time I give, um, uh, I send you the link for the recording. Uh, wait for a couple of days after the recording because you can go back to that same link. And not only can you view the video, but you can also download the transcripts. And that might actually help because essentially it, it is there in a text format what it is that I've said. So that maybe sometimes if you don't feel like watching the video, but you can actually go and see what I have said in the transcript and read it, it might be easier for some of you. So again, that's just a hint that I wanted to share. So now having said that, so we are in a class on sales strategy. So we've spent quite some time on talking about the definer driver, the sales effectiveness framework. And now we need to start talking about how do we take care of some of the biggest customers that we have. So I'm going to begin in terms of sales strategy by focusing on top, talking about the top of the top customers. Those are your key accounts, right? Again, if you go back, let me jog your memory. If you go back, this is the sales effectiveness framework. Again, you begin with what's happening with your company's results. Your company's results are going to depend upon whether your customer is doing well, plus what's happening in the environment and what's happening in the company that you work for. And of course, these three things are beyond the control of a sales manager. So we said you have this system here where we have to make sure that for the customers to be successful from a sales perspective, the only thing I can do is I have to manage what my salespeople are doing on a daily basis. Then I want to link it to, well, what kind of uh, uh, salespeople do I want? And then of course, going in and saying, okay, what kind of Salesforce structure do we need to have? Right? And then based on this, we said there are five drivers of Salesforce effectiveness, definers, shapers, et cetera. So you should know this by now. Now, the definers is where you define who are your key customers and who are not your key customers. And again, that's pretty much where, again, going back in, we talk about when you talk about the go-to market strategy, it is at this point, it is at the go-to market strategy where you again have to decide who are your very important customers? Who are your not so important customers? And if I have my not so important customers, how do I take care of them? Similarly, if I have very, very important customers, how do I take care of them as well? So that's again, something where we try and take a look at it. So again, going back, we know by now you've done your segmentation, you've done your customer offering. And again, in the exam, if, you, if I wanna jog your memory, this is your segmentation and targeting. And it is based on the sales process and the different kinds of sales process is where you have the application of the Hill-Rom way of segmenting as well. So just to give you a little bit of a heads up on that one, right? So by now, you know the four different kinds of sales processes. You have the transactional, functional, consultative, and enterprise. Of course, when all of this is happening, you also have the buying situation. This is something that we did not talk about last time. But this could be an exam question moving forward, right? Now, what is a buy? What is a new task? A new task, the key word here is buying. So which means that now you're focusing on the customer. So now when you try and take a look at it, you were asking yourself, is my sales process going to be simple or complex? Simple being, hey, I don't have to put too much effort into it. Complex being, oh my God, the customer is very demanding. I have to work hard towards getting that customer in, right? So that is what the, the sales process is. Now you can do this by understanding the sales process or you can see whether the process is gonna be easy or not based on taking a look at the customer and how the customer goes about buying it. 
Now, a buying situation, a new task buying situation is when the customer is looking to buy something new for the first time. Again, this is not a B2C, this is a B2B, business to business situation. Right? So what does a typical new task look like? The customer tries to identify the need or a problem that they will have. Then they will need to identify how to fix the problem. So they are looking for what are going to be the specifications that I will need. And the personal specification is to fix the problem. Then they will look for suppliers who can help them solve this problem. Then they will float an RFP or an RFQ. RFP stands for request for proposal. So they're going to ask the supplier to put a proposal in or a request for a quotation, right? Then they will analyze. They will analyze what proposals are made by the, uh, the different suppliers. Then they will negotiate and then they'll buy. So this is typically all the steps that goes in when you have a new task. Now, a modified rebuy, and the key word here is rebuy, occurs when a customer has gone through the whole process, has purchased it, then realizes maybe they want to make small changes. So what they will do, they will go back. So in a modified rebuy, they will work a little bit more on, has the problem changed a little bit? Maybe we have to change the specifications a little bit, but not too much but they will not necessarily look for suppliers because they're happy with the supplier that they have. There's not going to be for an RFP or an RFQ. They'll just have a kind of a negotiation and they'll end up buying it. So the modified rebuy is a, a lot shorter sales process because the customer already knows whom to buy from and they're only making small changes to what they have spent a lot of time trying to analyze. Straight rebuy is a straightforward action where you completely do not need to go through this because you've already done the homework, you're happy with your supplier and you're gonna go back and buy the same thing. Now, just like we discussed in this class in terms of your go-to market, if I'm talking about transactional and functional sale, the purpose of mine is to reduce cost of sale, that is I have to not use my expensive salespeople to go and sell. And the option of that is I am going to go indirect. That is, I'm gonna go with all of my channel partners, right? Channel partners would be your dealers, distributors, right? Uh, retailers, etc. Or, I could go through, not indirect, but I could go with e-commerce. And that is another topic we'll study later on this semester. There's e-commerce, right? Now, this side, in terms of consultative sale and enterprise sales, here is where you want to make sure that you want to take care of your customers. So here is where you go direct with your own salespeople, right? So now, if you go in, similarly, when you're talking about a new task, when a customer is buying something for the first time, typically it is going to be a consultative sale. So you might go direct, right? When you go for a modified rebuy, depending upon the size of the modified rebuy, because this customer is still relatively new, you will still go direct. But when you go for straight rebuy, here is where the customer knows exactly what they want. And if they want to buy more, you go with two options. Either you go with indirect, or you might decide to go with your e-commerce solution. That is the customer goes to your website and the salespeople don't necessarily have to go visit them. So again, this is how you try and take a look at it. But of course, your key accounts typically happen to be somewhere here. That is what we have is so essentially what is a consultative customer. So if you try and take a look at the transactional and the functional customers, usually the way it works is you have the seller 
and you have the buyer who interact and it's mostly that's what's all that is happening but now you go into consultative customers take back to the hill rom case you have a salesperson but now not only are you selling to the buyer but you're selling to other people within that customer's organization so suddenly i need to have my support here because this becomes a key customer and again go back and remember what you read from the hill rom case now this is usually what happens when you have more complex customers and the most complex customers are your key accounts when you go back and when you talk about the example we saw with mcc label when he talked about mcc label working together with the folks from procter and gamble or coca cola now what you have is that you don't have one on one but you actually have joint teams so this is the for, if you go back and i give the example the operations teams would be people from mcc plus the people from procter and gamble so there will be joint teams from both the supplier as well as the customer and this is the most complex form where there is a lot of teamwork that needs to happen to make sure that this is successful right so this is again these kind of customers here and here are where you're mostly going to look for key accounts and that is pretty much what we're trying to say here and again as i tried to explain what you will see is i tried to explain this again you will see that your key accounts are typically here where you have to put in a lot of resources and when you go in where the sale is going to be relatively smaller then you have less resources and then you go with channel partners now if you're probably wondering what these are these are your market segments and within each market segment you have different kind of customers okay so now the question is how do i choose who are these customers so between now and the rest of today's session i'm going to tell you about what criteria so how do i choose who are my key accounts and who are my consultative accounts right so in order to identify this and i've explained this already a little bit before when we talk about customer portfolio analysis but i'm going to explain and explain this to you again because this is very critical and when i ask you to actually do your assignment or when you have an exam later on when i talk about selection criteria for choosing customers i will expect a detailed answer that tries to lay out each one of these criteria so essentially what we have is when i have to choose criteria i am going to use four different categories of criteria the first is how much business do we currently do with that customer and what kind of business do we do right here there is no assumptions if the customer buys 100 dollars worth of products they buy 100 dollars worth of products if they buy 50 products then it's 50 products so there's no assumption it's exactly the business that you do with that customer then that alone is not enough because the needs of the customers might be constantly changing so then you have to see is are the needs of the customers evolving so that i can constantly grow and evolve with that customer then we will talk about well all of this is great but we also have to see whether the kind of customers that we want to be investing the kind of customers that we want to be spending more time with is there a fit between what we want to do together and finally you also have to ask yourself does the customer value the relationship so it's not that just you want that relationship with the customer it also depends upon whether the customer wants to work with you yes or no and that is something that you will have to work on and so if you take a look at the quantitative so in the next slides i will try to explain each one of these the first one is revenue so essentially what you want to try and do is that you have two options so essentially i have to choose from my key accounts i have quantitative criteria so this is what i'm doing is business i have it from two i have it from my who are who am i currently working with so i have to choose between all of my customers who are more important you have to, it's like playing favorites right 
And of course, it's not always with customers. There are some times where you say, hey, I want to go after that customer because that customer fulfills all the criteria that I'm looking for. So if I'm looking at current customers, what am I looking for? How much revenues or how much dollars can, has that customer spending with me, right? Now, if they're doing it, how much of it is in terms of margin? Essentially, what is margin here is that margin is going to be your listed price minus the price the customer actually pays. Right, so essentially you may list a price, but the customer might say, hey, but if I buy more from you, can you give me a discount? So that's the margin. Contribution is what percentage of your business is contributed to by the customer. And then you have profit, which is, hey, what is the margin that I'm making, so that's the margin from here, minus how much cost should I be spending to serve the customer? So here, the list price minus the price the customer pays is actually just very simple. So the customer, you have a price and the customer says, I want 10% discount, so that's the margin. But then when you start talking about the profit, the profit is not just the what the customer pays, but minus what you have to do to service the customer. So which means that if I have to produce a product, then I have to produce a product and I have to pay money for it. So essentially I have to produce a product, I have to spend money on it. So that's again, something that I have to subtract from the margin that I have. So that is what your profit is. This is all from your current customers. Now. Sometimes if you want to be taking at customers who are not customers yet, but that you want to attract, but you think are going to be important, then you start taking a look at what is the size of the customer? How big are they? How much revenues do they do? Are they in a growing market? How much do they spend with us? How much do they spend with the competition? So that if they're spending more money with the competition, can we take away that business? So essentially, current customers is where what business we're doing with the customers that we already have. But if I don't have the customers, what criteria do I look for? These would be the criteria that you're looking for. Of course, this is the next one, right? So the quantitative part, that's actually numbers, right? So essentially, you, there are numbers. There is no mistaking it or things like that. But here is the next one. Here is what it starts getting very interesting is where you have to see whether what the customer needs are going to be standard or does the customer look for completely customized solutions? And of course, your customers could be anywhere between this range. The idea being that the more customized the needs of the customer, the better it is for you because the more standard the needs of the customer, so the customer knows exactly what they want, the more standard the needs of the customers, you are going to have more competition because the customer can compare your offer to that of the competition and then try to drive down your price. So the main thing is that in terms of the needs of the customers, I'm looking for more of those customers who do not want to buy the product, they want to customize the product. So, which is something that is really nice. So again, if you try and take a look at what does the customized offering look like, the customer might say, hey, uh, I know that I'm buying from you. There's a lot of competition, but I am a customer. Let's say, for example, I'm Ford. I manufacture in 30 different countries. So can you supply me in 30 different companies, uh, different, different countries? That is global presence. So can a supplier meet it? So if this, is a, this is an example of a company where I was actually training them and they were selling glass. Uh, it's a company you might know called Saint Gobain. Uh, it's actually in Anderson here, if you're in close to Muncie. They have a Saint Gobain production facility. And Saint Gobain produces glass that goes into cars, and one of their customers is Ford. Now, what Ford says is that, hey, we have plants in the US, we have plants in Mexico, we have plants in Europe, we have plants in Asia. So then it asks Saint Gobain, hey, can you supply us in all these countries? Right? That is what is called global presence. Next, the other is dedication to compatible platforms. So essentially, the customer might say, hey, 
uh, I want to make sure that when I want to place an order, I want it in such a way that it is in a particular CRM system and can your CRM system work together with my CRM system? So essentially where the customer says is that we want you to spend more money on trying to work together. And that is again, something where if, if that is an important customer and the more you do these kind of customization, the more the customer also comes to rely on you. So you're locking up that customer as well. Special payment terms. Special payment terms is again interesting where the customer might say, you might say, hey, I want uh, you to pay, I want to supply a product to you and I want you to pay in 30 days. But the customer might say, you know what? No, I cannot do this. I want you to, I can only play in 60 days. So which means that the customer is asking for special payment terms and you don't want to do it for every customer. You only don't want to do it for your really important customers. Then of course, they might ask things like centralized billing. So essentially the customer might say, hey, I am Ford. I work with you in four different countries, but I don't want to pay from all the countries. I just want to pay through Michigan, through Detroit, and I have centralized billing. So again, you might be serving the customers in different parts of the world, but you will only have centralized billing. And again, this is something that you will have to specifically understand the needs of the customers and then fulfill them. And of course, there could be times where the customer says, hey, uh, we have this problem, but we are looking for a partner with whom we can work and co-create something new. So again, the more complex the needs of the customers, more the customer says, we want to work together with you, the better it is for you in terms of what we are looking for in that particular customer. And then of course you do all this. So essentially you try and see, okay, what revenues again, go back again. We've talked about quantitative stuff. We talked about the customer needs. Now we talk about strategic fit. All of this is great, but now we have to make sure that, hey, can my people get along with your people? We are looking to dominate this market. Are you also looking to dominate that market? Is there a fit between what you're looking for and what we can provide? And that is more at a higher level. And essentially there you start take, trying making look at for now, for the sake of this class, disregard this. So essentially what we're talking about is, let's say for example, can my CEO talk to your CEO? Can my sales director talk to your purchasing director? So essentially what we're talking about is that at all levels can be actually talk to each other so that we can understand your needs better and fulfill it. Now, if a customer says, nope, we do not want this to happen, it could be that they do not look at you as a partner that they want to work with. Of course, if you have the right kind of strategic fit, the customer should be willing to pay for value rather than focusing on price. And they should be willing to invest in building these kind of relationships so that you're not looking at the short term, but looking at the long term vision as well. Now, these three, so essentially what have we heard so far? We talked about quantitative outcomes. We talked about uh, the specific uh, customer needs. And then we talked about the level of strategic fit that we will have. But all of this is in the viewpoint of how we want to work with the customer. But the last one we should also understand is well, how does the customer view us? Does the customer think that we have a great product? Does the customer think that we have fantastic service? Remember, long time ago we said, your customer solution, that is the answer to the needs of the customer is gonna be a combination of my product, my service, and my brand. So the question is, how does the customer think of my product? How do they value my service? And do they think it is important for them to work with the brand? If they think that all of this are important and they have a very high opinion of you as a supplier, then that tells you that the customer values working with you. So essentially, if I go back and I want to look, take a look at this, I could artificially say how important is the customer to us that has 
your criteria, which is actually what is the quantitative outcomes. Quanti, quantitative outcomes. Then what are the needs of the customers and is there a strategic fit? So these are the questions that you will ask for in what you look for a customer. But then when you do this, you should also ask yourself how important are we to the customer? Right? And this is your business strengths. So essentially, the higher the business strength you have, the more important the customer looks at you as being a key supplier. Once I have this, then I know what are the criteria I am looking for. And then what you do is this is something that uh, you don't necessarily have to focus on. And then you start going into this here. And I am going to explain this to you now. And when I do ask this question in the exam, it could be that you will have to explain this in your own words. So we said, what are the different criteria? We said there are quantitative outcomes. We said there are going to be customer needs. Then we said we're going to be looking at strategic fit. And then we say, well, what is our supplier strength? So how does the customer view us? And we're gonna use all this to try and see which customers are the ones we have to go after, who are our key customers, right? So if you go to quantitative outcomes, right? So I'm gonna say quantitative outcomes could be, what is the current revenue? Revenue, remember, is the how much dollars does the customer pay? And same quantitative, what is the profit that we make with the customers? Let's say that's one of those things. So these are your quantitative outcomes. Then for the needs of the customers, let us say the customer is looking for special payment terms. Again, now, and the customer might say, well, I want global presence. So then your customer needs come here and here. Again, revenue profit comes from here, from here, right? And then customized needs, the global presence and special payment terms come from customer needs. Then let's go back and let's say, Then let's say willingness to pay for value. That comes from strategic fit. And then they say they value our product strength and our service strength. This is what we have from here. From here, the service strength. So let's say we do this and this comes from here. And then we said, then what do we do? We need to ask ourselves within our organization, what is the most important criteria? So typically let us say your organization says, well, how much business we do with the customer is extremely important. How much profit we want to do. Typically 50% of the criteria could be is based on this. Now, the, an organization does not always want to give special payment terms. So let's say this is five. Uh, global presence is something that they might value. So now we're looking at 35, 50. That is 50, 70. This is definitely 20, 20, five, and five. So let's say all of this adds up to 100, right? So it's 35 plus 15 is 50, 55, 70, 90, 95. 100. So essentially, this is the importance that you place for and what you're looking for when you go in and look for a potential customer and ask yourself, is that customer important or not? 
right? So of course, what you're gonna do, you're gonna rate. So now what do you do? This could be customer A. If you want to go back, for example, with uh, the example of uh, MCC label, this could be Procter and Gamble. This could be Coca-Cola. So each would be a different customer. And you ask yourself, which customer is more important to us, Coca-Cola or Procter and Gamble? So let us say you rate between zero to 10. So you ask the salespeople to say, hey, in terms of the revenue, the money that we make with Coca-Cola, how much do we actually do? Well, maybe we don't get all the business, but I think it's a seven. Profit, well, we are doing pretty good in terms of profitability. The customer is not very demanding on payment terms, so that is actually good. The customer does not value global presence. The customer pays for value, eh, I'm not sure. Product strengths, we have a great quality. That's what the customer thinks. Let's say this is what you have to give about how you're looking at the customer. So now what happens, this column then will be this relative weight, that's the weight that you have here, multiplied by the rating that you have here. So that is 35 multiplied by seven, that would be 3,235. Again, this is 35 multiplied by seven. This is 15 multiplied by nine, that would be 135. You can do the math. This is 45, this is 30, this is 100, this is 35, and this is 35. So if you add up, it's 235 plus 135. That is, again, 370, uh, 415, 445, 545. That's 615. Similarly, let's say for Coca-Cola, the revenue-wise, uh, we're not doing so much. Profit-wise, again, this is a customer that's squeezing us a lot. Special payment terms, they keep squeezing us all the time. Uh, global presence, uh, they do like it. Uh, will pay for value, yes, they're pretty okay. Uh, this is something five and five. Then you say, okay. Then again, what we're gonna do, we're gonna calculate this again. This is the weight multiplied by rating, which is 35 multiplied by five will give you 35, 150, 175. 15 multiplied by five, again here, just to give you an idea, is 75, five multiplied by three is 15, 15 multiplied by nine is 135, 20 multiplied by eight is 160, this is 25, and this is again 175. So what's good this going to be? No, sorry, this is five multiplied by five is, sorry, five multiplied by five here, this is 25, sorry. So, so the total is going to be 175 plus 75, 250, 265. Uh, this is going to be 400, 560. You're going to be 610. So what you're going to see is that both these customers are more or less equally going to be important. So these two are important customers. Let's say you have another account and you end up with 400. Then you know that your key accounts are these two because they score much higher than 400. So this is how you go about selecting your key accounts. When we come back in the next class, I will pretty much go over some of the pack pack questions that you have and slowly start. Once I understand the key accounts, now how do I work with the key accounts? And that is something that we will discuss in the next session. Again, thank you for your patience.